Hello, innovators. I'm Todd Wyant, and welcome to the Bridge in the Gap podcast presented by Applied Software. You're invited to join our MEP and construction innovation adventure with a mission to propel this great industry forward. My guest today is Doug Howard, Director of Consulting for Remodelers Advantage, a leading authority on small business strategy specializing in the home remodeling industry. Doug has worked with owners of growing businesses for almost 25 years to help them overcome challenges and develop strategies for successfully navigating growth. Welcome to the show, Doug. Thanks, Todd. It's great to be here. Uh, absolutely. So let's start with how you got into the construction industry. Well, you know, I had had a uh, kind of a history of doing accounting and consulting uh, for many years, had a business of my own for about 17 years. And uh, when we started shifting more to consulting and, and started selling off some of the accounting components of it, um, I actually uh, found Romato's advantage as a project. Um, we were out on LinkedIn looking for some work to do some strategic planning, uh, and they hired me to do some strategic planning work for them. Uh, and then we really kind of uh, hit it off. We found that a lot of the needs of, so Romano's Advantage is really known for, for developing peer groups uh, mm -hmm. of successful remodeling co companies all over the country, uh, wanted to develop a consulting capability, and it was just a really good match. So the way they describe it is I, I came and did their strategic planning, and then I refused to leave. Uh, <laughs> hey, sometimes you just got to do that, you know? <laughs> Yeah, no, I found that to be very effective. Just, just don't leave. So. That's right. Yeah. Squatters' rights. That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, so the peer group concept. I'm a big fan of of peer groups as well. What do you see as some of the the big advantages that people should kind of leverage with peer groups? Well, you know, one of the things is, especially if they're non competitive peer groups, you know, so we mm -hmm. separate them geographically. There's other ways to do that too, but is really just having people that you can truly open up to that really know what's going on behind the scenes. I think a lot of business owners get advice from folks that are well-intentioned, but if they really don't know the numbers or know what's going on with you know, key staff members, things like that, there's only so much that, that advice can, can really help. Um, on top of that, I think right now, we've seen this so much over the last two years, when you have something that's so profound like COVID or something like that, there's just no way to prepare for something like that. So to have a group of folks that are going through the same processes, the same uh, challenges, uh, really becomes very valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's nothing like that shared lived experience uh, yes. to create that understanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, the interesting thing with COVID was it, it, the way it rolled out across the country was different. Certain areas had it much a much greater impact early on, right? So there were folks that were saying, hey, it hasn't even hit here that way yet. And there was yeah. an element of opportunity to say, okay, well, when you all went through this, what happened. And then when the second round came around, uh, you know, there was a, another level of awareness that folks had, uh, really could really benefit from what other people had tried. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's sort of that evolution of a, of a, of a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what do you think is one of the biggest misconceptions in the construction industry right now? Um, I, I think one of the biggest misconceptions right now, I guess, is really that, um, you know, that you can't find help. I mean, I know it's challenging mm -hmm. um, and, and you certainly have to work harder to do that, but good companies with good cultures are, are you know, being able to fill their teams and build their organizations. Um, the other thing is right now, there's a lot of material disruption and things like that. And I think because of it, there's almost a feeling of, since I can't have as much confidence in the schedule as maybe I used to because of outside forces, I maybe should be a little bit lax in the schedule at all, or it's not really as meaningful when mm -hmm. in fact, we're really strong believers that because there's more things we can't control, we have to be extremely good at the things we can control. Yeah. You know? And so I think this whole notion of, can you even do strategic planning? Can you chart a course in these times? Um, there's a, there's a real feeling out there that, well, you know, you just can't cause you don't know what's coming around the next corner. And I'm a firm believer that you have to, because you don't know what's coming around the next corner. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm right there with you. Yeah, I'm a big believer in that. So let's dive into the strategic planning part of it. What role does the strategic planning play in creating that profitable company? Well, I, you know, I think there's a couple of things. I think one is it provides that rudder right now, right, to say, okay, well, we know where we're supposed to be headed. We know where we're supposed to be, uh, what level we should be achieving at. So when things are really disrupted, it gives us a really good idea of how far off the mark, early indicators to get back on track things that really 
um, in, in, the, in the midst of a lot of activity. Because right in the remodeling world right now, we're seeing a ton of activity, right? And sometimes that can be deceptive. You're super busy, you have lots of work, and that can, that can look like profitability. When in reality, uh, it can be exactly the opposite as projects get drawn out longer and that kind of thing. So I, I think a big part of it is just knowing where you stand relative to uh, the work that you're actually uh, doing. The other thing is, is that I find that people tend to think in years, you know, we do annual budgets, the things we're going to do. Um, I'm a big believer that it's fun to watch the ball drop. I don't think it changes fundamentally what's going on in the world. Um, <laughs> and what I find is most really impactful changes take two to three years, sometimes a little longer to implement. Mm -hmm. And when we think in years, you know, a lot of times small businesses will get into this mindset of, you know, I'm halfway through the year, I'm having a good year or I'm having not so good a year. And it colors the way they do things. You know, they either accelerate some things or put a hold on some things. When you look at that planning as a three to five year window, you know, and you come out of that first year or any given year, not having accomplished what you needed to, or the landscape changed, it causes you then to recalibrate and put more demand on those other years, you know? So I always tell people, if you're gonna take a five day road trip and you didn't get as far as you wanted to the first day, you do something the second day if the destination of the time was important, right? You'd leave early or drive faster, whatever. In business, when we look at things in annual you know, slices, that pressure kind of gets lost along the way. And things that are more than a year's worth of thinking or planning or evolution or staff development, whatever it is, um, sometimes continually just get pushed out. Mm -hmm. And that's the one thing that I think holds some companies back. Yeah, that's really interesting. So how do you encourage people to change that mindset then and, and build in the patience that's required to take that longer view. Yeah, it, it's hard, um, you know, but we really start every engagement with a, with a five-year plan. Uh, and so we come in, in contact with folks. It's like, okay, the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to assume it's five years from today. Tell me where you live, how, you, you know, how you're working, what you're driving, how many weeks vacation you took, put yourself in that place. Now tell me about your company. Have we grown? What kind of projects are we doing? What do you think's going on in the industry? More often than not, you know, you get much beyond five, it's a little fuzzy. Uh, and you get much less than three, it's a little bit more of the immediate issues. But mm -hmm. somewhere in that range, folks do a pretty good job of, of being able to kind of answer the fundamental questions of, I want more of this and less of that, right? I want it to look more like, or these are the options I want to have at that particular point in the future, not knowing if, I'm going to still want to be working this hard or if I'm going to feel good enough to work that hard or whatever it is. Once they get that, and I always tell people, we're not going to worry about anything in between year one and year five. We're just going to put everything in the bucket that we're going to need for year five. And then we'll figure out what the, the, the timing of it is and where it should fit. Because a lot of decisions that people make that looks, look like they're kind of if decisions, like, like should I do this or should I do it? It's yeah. not a matter of if, it's really a matter of when. Right? If you're going to get three years out and you know you're going to need a bigger staff, a production manager, or, you know, whatever it happens to be, we're really trying to pick the right timing, not decide whether or not we're going to do it. But when you take it in too short a chunk, it becomes an if decision, and that's easy to put off or, or really lose focus on the bigger thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like with starting with the end in mind, put everything in that, that bucket, and then you, it gives you the flexibility and the freedom to move things around as right. things change. Well, I always tell people in the construction world, right? You would never start a project by just throwing lumber on the front lawn and start nailing things together to see where it takes. <laughs> it right? could be really exciting though. <laughs> it could be really exciting. And I've had one person say, yeah, that's exactly how I do it. But that we don't encourage that, right? But really what it comes down to is the reason why people that are successful in the industry are is because they can look at a picture or hear someone's idea. They have a very clear picture of what that looks like in the end. And they're really working backwards from there in terms of scheduling, materials needed, those kinds of things. When it comes to the business side of things, you know, a lot of folks, and I've been guilty of this in my career as well, you just start grabbing boards and nailing things together and figure it's going to look like something at some point. Yeah. And so really kind of putting it in that context, help people say, oh, yeah, well, I would never start without a plan or design or blueprint. Well, let's do the design or blueprint and then figure out where to go. You know? Yeah, I think that's a great illustration. It's, it's funny because... People can be so good in, in one area and the skills translate directly to another area, but then they just don't translate it. <laughs> yes. 
This is why nobody lets me use their tools, Todd. You wouldn't want to see me build a birdhouse, let alone anything, <laughs> that, anything that somebody had to live in. So. Nice. Uh, well, how does having a mindset of selling your business, whether you want to or not, how does having that mindset help drive future profitability really in like yeah. today? Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's a couple of things. First of all, it's a longer term perspective. So it kind of helps have that discussion right off the bat. Mm. The second thing is that is the, the things you would want to do, the things that drive um, the selling price of a business, sort of that multiplier that you can apply to whatever the business's value is in terms of its profitability. Those characteristics also are true of a really good, strong, solid business, even if you don't ever sell or you give it to the next generation or whatever. So for example, a business that is less dependent on the business owner for all of the critical tasks is more valuable when you go to sell it because that, that future buyer has a lot more assurance they're going to be able to continue on, that it's not just the personality or the individual characteristics of that owner that's driving the business. But also, it says that in the short run, it allows us to develop talent. It, it requires us to put better procedures in place. It allows the owner to take eight weeks of vacation as opposed to working in the business 70 hours a week. All those things go hand in hand. Um, but when we put it in the context of what would it take to make this more sellable, it's easier for the business owner to extract themselves out of the picture, which I think is the hardest part for business owners to do. You know, folks that have read the E-Myth and, you know, the idea of working on the business and not in the business. And a lot of folks understand that concept. But then if you look at their day timer or how they've planned out their next week, it doesn't reflect that at all. You know, they're knee deep in the business. And so it prevents them from really taking that perspective. And, and so there's some other things too, some other factors like good processes and procedures, a strong brand, developing talent, all those things that say, if I were to walk out of here today or put this on the market today, that would drive the price up. Those things also make sense to do whether someone's going to be there for three more years or 30 more years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's one thing to have the, the head knowledge that you should disseminate and then it becomes very personal it's your baby it's your project so you get yes. way more invested in it. it becomes a lot harder to kind of hold it at that objective arm's length it is well you know the folks that have generally been successful in the industry they're doers right right they're the folks that when there's 10 seconds left on the clock they want the ball yeah right? they don't want to sell the sidelines <laughs> right right and and so when they you know that's why you'll see some folks in other industries that you know they sort of have that player coach mentality which generally doesn't work out in sports you know it's really hard to be a great coach while you're also wondering if someone's going to pass you the ball. Right. And so because of that, when, when, when business owners are knee deep in being the salesperson or the sales manager or the production manager, yes, they're looking at the whole organization, but they're also looking at the piece of the organization they're most responsible for, which lacks a little bit of objectivity to get the whole thing working. Yeah. So how do you coach people to take that step back or, or kind of create some of that, that distance. Sure. Yeah. So when we do that five-year look ahead, right, we do an org chart that they're not allowed to put themselves, in, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that becomes an issue. It was like the first time I had an attorney do my will. And I, and I was, you know, sort of saying, well, I'd like more of this and less of that. She's like, you're dead. Okay. <laughs> I understand that when we put this together, you're dead. So, you know, telling that business owner, we're going to design this without you in there or with you on the sidelines really then causes them to think, well, is there somebody that could develop into that role? What would the next best person be? Or we don't have any procedures in that area. Um, and it starts to really elicit some of those conversations that become really the game plan to get that business to that future place. Yeah. And then, of like course, that. then the challenge in all of that is to get to be able to do that, to make that transition and still be financially successful, right? Usually when we finish this exercise, they need six new positions, procedures, maybe some new software, whatever it is. And then we look at the cost of that. And it's like, well, if I did that today, right, the company couldn't support that. Mm -hmm. So the timing of how we kind of balance that whole, you know, ultimate resource of time, people, and money, right, really becomes the, the juggling factor. It becomes what causes some companies to be able to grow very well. And, but it also becomes the ceiling by which a lot of companies start to grow. They get a little bit down the road and then they have to retract because something is out of sync. Mm -hmm. um, so so how do you keep your foot on the, that continual improvement gas while yeah. driving that sustained profitability? 
Well, a big part of it is having that multi-year plan and, and making sure that when you look at sort of budgeting for five years or laying out the finances, the next step in the process isn't necessarily driven by uh, the date or the calendar, but it's driven by a set of circumstances. In other words, when we get to this level of profitability or this set of conditions or this backlog of work, this is when we're going to add the next piece in, which allows us to keep moving down the path, but in a way that balances the cash flow, profitability, financial base of the company, so we don't get too far out ahead of ourselves. Mm -hmm. By the same token, we overlay a little bit of the calendar on it to say, you know, if we're in year three and a half of five years, and this stuff is going to take longer than that to do, we, we've got to turn the pace up. You know, so you want those early indicators. So I'm a big believer of year one of a five-year plan tells a lot of tales. You know, it really talks about whether or not we've gotten the plan right, we have the right pace, are we starting to make changes? A lot of times people realize in maybe year three of a five-year plan that we're really not getting traction, which really means the five-year plan becomes a seven and a half or eight year or whatever. Yeah, you know, it just plan. keeps kicking the can down the road. <laughs> right, well, and that's why some people say, you know, I was doing this five years ago, but I don't feel like I've made headway towards it. And it's like, well, you know, in some respects they haven't. They've maybe dealt with the, the immediate operational challenges of the business, but they really have a better position that business for that ultimate transition or that new configuration. Yeah. Um, so those that may have a, a natural reluctance to kind of embracing growth mindset, the continual improvement, how do you encourage those to, to come over to this mindset? Well, you know, part of it, a lot of it is talking about the end game. You know, it's like, well, you know, how long do you really want to work? Is this something you want to do forever? Uh, I get a lot of calls from folks when they're in their maybe early to mid 40s. And I usually ask them, is it your knees or your back that made you call me this morning? It's <laughs> like they start feeling the burden of, yeah. of being in a very physical industry. Um, and, uh, and they start to think, you know, I might be able to do this for a, a certain period of time, but then I'd like to benefit from the fruits of my labor. And they don't really always know how to do that because they've been the doer. Right. right. Sometimes there's an outside influence. There's a son or daughter in the business that really is, they know they're the successor, but, you know, there's a lot of holdup and sort of progression, progressing. Um, and so sometimes they can be a catalyst. Sometimes it's a spouse, you know, that says, hey, I'm four years away from retirement and you said you were four years away from retirement and you're not acting like you're four years away from retirement, you know? And so it really comes down to what are the influencers going to be for someone to successfully transition either out of their business or even just to take a step back, I believe they have to be headed towards something better. They can't just be heading away from something. Mm -hmm. And there's a st statistic that came out of the value builder study that said, you know, one in three business owners that sell are, you know, are disappointed with their situation, you know, at some point after the sale, I think it's three years after the sale or something like that, because they had, they weren't transcending to travel or to write a book or to do the next thing they wanted to do. All they've done is sort of, you know, lose the identity that they had for a long period of time. So a lot of it is, well, you know, why do you want to make that change? What are you going to do when, when you're mm -hmm. not knee deep in this stuff? But for most folks, they really do have, you know, a, a broader vision. They just have to know that, that they can get there. Yeah. I think for some folks, it just feels like, well, those conversations are fine, but they're just not realistic because I worked 75 hours last week and we still didn't get it. Yeah. No, that's interesting. What do you think are some of the, the biggest obstacles standing in the way of a remodeling company and growth? Well, you know, right, right now, the most immediate thing is uh, it's kind of like the COVID paradox, right? Like some businesses, you know, surge went up. Some businesses really almost you know, stopped existing. In the remodeling world and some of the construction world, there's been this weird split where all of a sudden there's a huge demand for service offset by less people and less ability to get a hold of materials. So the spread in being able to produce has created this enormous challenge uh, all at one time. And so I think right now the, the biggest challenge is really just getting those things uh, to line up. The hardest thing in any service business, you know, if, if you have a manufacturing business, retail business, you build that next facility, it's a capital investment, right? You go out, you finance it properly, you build the financial structure. In a service business, that growth, that capital investment is people. 
So it immediately starts to deplete resources in terms of profitability, owner's time, training requirements. And that is the hardest thing is to say, okay, how do we make sure that the, the organizational chart keeps pace with the, all the other ambitions we have? And it's easy to come up with a financial goal for five years. It's even relatively easy to come up with a strategic plan. Getting that to mesh with the development of people and the advancement of people and attracting them, that to me is the hardest thing. Right. Well, it's one thing to have a, a warm body in that role, but to have the right person in the right role at the right time. Yes. I mean, for the yeah, right no, reason. It, it is. It's, it's really, it's really hard. And, you know, sometimes people can be really good at, at what they do. Um, but as the company starts to outpace that, they start to grow. We see a lot of times the first time a company has a level of middle management, um, they have managers that have never really managed before. They're used to their performance measures being their individual measures. Uh -huh. And that, that responsibility for developing other people, accountability, even just communication becomes really, really challenging. By the same token, there are a lot of cultures out there amongst these companies that say, I don't want to hire somebody in above that person or to supervise that person. So it really becomes an interesting crossroads when they're growing rapidly. Say, well, how are you going to achieve that, that level of management that's somewhere between the founder, right, and the folks at the operating level doing the work? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So what's the, what's the low hanging fruit there? What's kind of that next yeah. right thing that people should look at? Well, I, th I think if you can get a little bit clear on what the, the, the org chart looks like, first of all, if you know there's someone that you see moving along in a, in a progression, having that conversation, right? There's nothing worse than losing a really good employee that goes somewhere else because they're looking for opportunity. That's an opportunity you were more than willing and actually planned on giving them at some point in the future but never mm -hmm. had that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a really lousy conversation when they say, well, I'm going here for this opportunity. And you say, well, I'll give you that opportunity. It's sort of, you know, too little, too late at that point. Right. So there's that. But I believe anybody that's going to have a significant role in the impact of the company, which really to some extent is almost everybody, you need an individual development. plan. There needs to be training, whether it's internal, out, you know, external, uh, if someone's going to be a manager and they've never managed before, if they're going to need to understand numbers and that's not been their thing, you know, uh, we, we kind of joke, what, what's the thing they say? If you stay in a Holiday Inn Express, you're that much smarter the next morning, <laughs> you're right? It's like, yeah. well, that can be your plan or, you know, we can decide they're going to need these skills and we're going to train them. A lot of times, you know, we, the senior level folks or the owners thinking about what they want their progression to be. And there's an assumption that sort of the, the tide will rise with them. But there's not a lot of effort and, and specifics put to making sure po other folks are ready to step into those roles. Yeah, yeah, uh, interesting. So I think that's a big point. Build a culture of over communicating and supportiveness. Yeah, and conti continual training and development. Continually, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, those those people are the best asset the company has. You know, and just like you would you would you know maintain a piece of equipment, just like you you know all the things that go into the other assets that you have. Nurture them, develop them, make sure that you know, you're, you're giving them the best so they can give them the best. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, if you could innovate one thing in the industry, what would it be? Um, I, I think it would be, I could innovate one thing in the, yeah, I, I think there's still a tremendous amount of opportunity for technological integration throughout the system. You know, the customer, the supplier, you, you know, there's bits and pieces out there. But there's really, you know, as compared to other industries, there's not that level of technological sophistication, um, you know, at some levels that just say, let's pull this all together, you know, that don't require redundant entry of, of things or patching, you know, different pieces together. It really takes a holistic approach to bringing in all the stakeholders into a project. Because the one thing that struck me about remodeling when I got, first started working with Remodel was Advantage, and now over the last four or five years I've been doing this exclusively, is Unlike a lot of other industries, no projects happen without a lot of people being involved. There are lots of handoffs in a construction mm -hmm. project as opposed to lots of other industries. And so in that, I just think technology can be a great tool. We've seen some of that with COVID. You know, it's funny now that people look at things like, like we used to try to have a Zoom call every now and then with our groups, and we couldn't get a one-hour call to work, right? Now we can right. have a three-day <laughs> conference, you know, uh, online. But people are finding like even now that they're getting out and getting back face to face with customers, there are certain things like, you know, pre-qualifying that project or getting a scan of the house ahead of time or all, 
are all things that just make sense, whether or not there's a health issue or not. Sure. Right? But I think there's still a, there's a, another generation of technology that's going to pull these pieces together. It's still a little bit more of a treasure hunt than I think it probably ought to be. Mm. So with the technology coming into the space, what new roles do you think will be kind of born into the industry come the next yeah, you know, no, five that's or so a great years? Question. I mean, I think one of them is going to be a huge training and development work, right? Because there's going to, there are a lot of folks in the industry that, you know, love construction. They're very successful at what they do. They're very hands-on. Um, but, and, and this isn't true of everybody, but, but for some, it's just technology and, and the way we're using technology becomes an obstacle become something they don't want to do or the reason why they went a different direction, you know? And so it's got to be much more, I think, um, user-friendly. It's got to be much more uh, not designed for someone that's really thinks maybe uh, in a technological way or even in an analytical way. Uh, so it's got to embrace all sectors. You know, we like use, do, using um, different assessments and things like that, different personalities. Mm -hmm. I think someone's got to make sure that it's not just the the tech people in an organization that are being well fed by the technology, but it really is being customized and adapted to every kind of personality. You know, yeah. it's like, it's like when it, it, you know, years ago when the thought of like ATM cards was like, yeah, well, you know, only the really exotic techie people had them for a period of time and now, or cell phones, right. You know, it's yeah. like, it, it's just the norm. You know, I think there are things right now that still seem exotic from a technological standpoint in our industry it'll just be the norm if we do this successfully. Sure. Uh, so with training and development, I'm a really big proponent of the concept of reverse mentoring. I don't know if you're familiar with that at all, but you, you take somebody that is techie, you pair them with somebody with the, the real world field experience and they train each other on the real world field experience and then on the tech and you get that kind of cross collaboration between both. So you start getting the, the best of both worlds. Yeah, I, I think I probably experienced that when I came with the Romano as an advantage. No one would describe me as being technologically savvy. Um, I did know a lot about business. And when I did get paired on some projects and ultimately with, with our uh, IT person, it was great because as I started to get an appreciation for it, it's like, well, you know, show me the next thing. Like, what, what else can we do? And it's funny because, uh, you know, I have six kids. And, and so when they hear me talking about apps or, hey, have, have you, did, did you guys use this? Or they're like, like you, you were like walking around with a legal pad for the last 40 years. Like, when did you, <laughs> when did you find out what an app was? Right. But, it, but it really is an opportunity. Once you let that guard down and say, well, sure. If there's an easier way to do it, let's, let's, you know, dig into it. So yeah, I, I love the concept. I think it's, I think it's great. That's also, you said something pretty prophetic there that you have to let your guard down in order for it to, to work well and to be open to embracing the, the tech. I think that's huge. Yeah. You know, I tell people, it's funny because uh, I, I was not born out of the remodeling or construction industry. And I, one of the things that really helped me because, you know, I'm not always the easiest to train or coach and that kind of thing. You know, I have strong opinions and that. When I came into this industry, it was a lot easier to be able to be the person that's like, listen, I don't know anything about what you're talking about. Take me through this from step one. And whether or not it's because you don't know or because you really just need to go through that process, a lot of times there's an assumption of, a common understanding of things that probably shouldn't be assumed. We should do a lot more of like, let's just walk this right, like walk through this. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Or right. I don't know that industry jargon. Right. Yeah. Because sometimes I think there's a lot of, gee, I'm supposed to know that term. So I'm going to nod my head. Right. And then sure. later on, you realize if someone asks some really fundamental questions, we find a lot of times, like we see this with process improvement. Why do we do something? You know, once you sort of dig into where it originated from, you know, we still have lots of procedures that were, were the procedure before the new technology came along that we're still doing because it made us feel good during the transition to do both. And we've never let go of that, that piece of paper that now is totally redundant with seven other things that we're doing. You yeah. know, and a lot of it comes down to when you go through that process um, analysis to say, okay, tell me what that step is and why you're doing it. And it's interesting, it was interesting when someone says, well, well, that takes us two hours on every project and really don't need to be doing it at all. I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to guess we could find better time, better use for that time. Yeah. And so it's, it's that evolution of kind of digging into the core of things. Yeah. I was actually having this conversation the other day with somebody of 
people being reluctant to say, uh, I don't know what that is, or, uh, you know, explain that to yeah. me where they, they view it as weakness instead of the power that comes with saying, I don't know, explain that to me. And then you start right. to learn so much more. And it's, it's really a, a secret superpower to admit. I don't know that. Talk to me about it. Right. Well, that's why three-year-olds learn at an incredible rate. Right? They, have, <laughs> they have, they have no embarrassment about the fact that like, listen, I was, you know, I was born, I don't know anything. So teach yeah. me everything. Right. And they'll ask why until the cows come home and, and, you know, they're really learning at a rapid pace. When we do continuous improvement, there's this concept of the five whys to get to the, the root core and root cause of an issue. Right. And, you know, when, when adults do that at a really, you know, in a really sincere way, other than the fact it's a little annoying to someone who first starts, what they're really doing is digging down to the things they maybe don't know, but they really should. Um, and, and it really clears away that notion that, um, you know, I feel funny about asking or I should know. That, so, yeah, you, you struck a chord. I have a three-year-old at home and she's, oh, then you hear why. Why. <laughs> that's right. All the time, yeah, yeah, all the yeah, time. Yeah. She is in that why phase for sure. <laughs> Well, you, you know, so, so you should take her out on job sites and tell her that she can do process improvement. Because, you know, <laughs> there you go. Until she's, until she's satisfied with the answer, don't let that project manager off the hook. Nice. Yeah, we would yeah. get to the bottom of things for sure. That's exactly right. Put the three-year-olds back in charge. Right. I like it. Yeah. Well, how do people find out more information about what you guys are doing and connect with you? So um, they can connect with me at, uh, my email is Doug at remodelersadvantage.com. If someone wants to just schedule something with me, they can actually go to www.15minuteswithdoug.com and that'll get them right into my calendar. Uh, or they can go to remodelersadvantage.com's website. We've got lots of information there as well. Nice. Awesome. Final question for you. What does innovation mean to you? Oh, innovation means to me, you know, truly just never being satisfied with the status quo. You know, one of my favorite quotes is some men see things as they are and say, why? I dream things that never were and say, why not? It's mm -hmm. like the why nots are really where we're headed. It's, it's, it's to unlock the secrets of not what we can envision today, but, you know, just the amazing places we could go, can go, that we could never have envisioned uh, sometime earlier in our, in our lives or in our history and our business. So uh, to me, that's what keeps things super exciting. Yeah, I like it. That's a great way to end it. Thanks so much, Doug. Appreciate the sure. conversation. All right. Thanks for having me, Todd.